By the way, sorry, my if my dogs just go nuts. Yeah. It's so amazing you have them. And, and they're everywhere. They're on your Instagram as well. <laughs> they're my little babies. <laughs> it's such a beautiful picture that you have with them. I love dogs. I'm myself a dog lover, by the way. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, uh, hi, guys. We're live now. Hi, guys. So we're live now. Thank you so much, Susan and Sana, for taking up the time, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of University of Central Punjab, I would like to welcome you all to our fifth session of Ideas Conclave. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled to be uh, hosting uh, Susan Abulhawa, author of uh, Against the Loveless World and Mornings in Janine, and uh, also the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine. Uh, the session will be moderated by Sana Waka, who is a teacher and also reviews her, uh, is a book reviewer and runs uh, her page, The Reading Nook, Pakistan. Thank you so much, Sana, and I'll be uh, handing it over to you. And thank you so much, Susan, once again, for taking out the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raza, for that wonderful uh, introduction to our talk. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Sana Vakar, and I've come in from The Reading Nook doing this for UCP Punjab, uh, the University of Central Punjab. And it is my absolute honor to be interviewing and being in conversation with Susan Abulhawa. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to give her the introduction she very much deserves. Susan Abulhawa is a human rights activist, a biologist, a novelist, poet, political commentator, and a mom. She is the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine, a children's organization dedicated to upholding the right to play for Palestinian children. Her debut novel, Mornings in Janine, uh, was an international bestseller translated into 26 languages. She lives in Pennsylvania with her daughter and their beloved dogs. Thank you so much, Susan, for joining us today. We are absolutely thrilled to be talking to you about uh, the many things and the many hats that you don. Thank you, Sana. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So, Susan, I'm going to be diving right in because I feel we've lost out on some time uh, due to technical issues. Uh, I'm going to be diving straight into the conversation. I want to start this by talking about the book that you have so beautifully displayed behind you, and it's in my hands right now. This is Against the Loveless World by Susan Hapulhawa. So, Susan, I've read this book, and it's a wonderful portrayal of uh, life as displaced as it, it, it has uh, been for Palestinians all around the uh, Middle East or the world, uh, people such as yourself, because I believe that your family was also displaced uh, in one of the many wars. Yeah. Could you um, talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so um, I think most Palestinians are displaced um, in one way or another. Um, we're either displaced or we're caged by, um, by our colonizers. Um, my parents were refugees from the 67 war in the same way that not his family, not his parents were refugees of, uh, of that same war. Um, and like Nahar, um, I was also born in Kuwait. Um, so I think, you know, the parallels kind of go straight down from. Yeah. yeah. So let's d dive right in. Against the Loveless World is a story of one woman. And as you've mentioned, Nahar is her name, but she dons many names and she's uh, referred to in uh, very many names by her own self at times as well. And it's the story of this girl who's displaced, who's finding her, her identity, herself, uh, starts off with a, as a very regular girl with very regular ambitions. But by the end of the book, uh, there's a major transformation that takes place. So I would like to ask you first about your motivation behind writing Nahar and telling her story. How did you come to think of this? So... Um... You know, this was kind of a story that I wanted to write for a long time. Um, uh, in particular, I mean, I was interested in uh, writing about sexual exploitation um, <clears throat> that's pervasive, uh, actually, you know, all over the world, um, but, but certainly in our culture as well. And, you know, there's just some things that we rarely talk about. Uh, in literature and public discourse. And I think it's important to address these, you know, address the, um, the issues that women, uh, women endure and women go through. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to 
um, take this person, this woman who is pushed to the margins of a society that's already on the margins of society, um, mm -hmm. to, to, to take this woman and put her in an exalted position um, yeah. at the same time and see how, how those contradictions get reconciled um, within her own self, within her family, within her friends and within the society and the world at large. Um, and, and to see what it means to move the center to the margins, to, to go and exalt this woman who is, um, who represents everything that, that society abhors and repudiates. Um, so that was, uh, that was part of the motivation. I also wanted to um, explore that the particular moment in history when um, Saddam occupied oh. Kuwait uh, and what it meant for um, what it meant for at least for this family, this one family, but for the entire region actually, uh, what it meant for the United States to then invade Iraq, um, <clears throat> what it meant on the uh, on the micro level, on the individual family level. So, um, and then I also, and then the third aspect was to, um, I also wanted to explore other means of Palestinian resistance. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was also going to come down to that because Nahar starts off uh, as anyone, she, she doesn't really, in the beginning of the book, she doesn't really have any affiliations with Palestine, except for the fact that her parents tell her that she's from that place. And by the end of the by the end, end of the book, I don't want to give away too much right now, but she cares deeply about it so much so as to uh, you know indulge in activism and indulge in a rebellion uh, that, that that is for the state of Palestine. And uh, I feel that with this, you've also kind of made a comment about what drives people towards a rebellion or what drives them or births resistance in them. And is this something that you have observed over the past over the past couple of years? And if you have, uh, let us know a little bit about it. What is it like for Palestinians who are displaced around the world? So I mean, we all engage in resistance in one way or another. I mean, it's not a matter of what drives us. I mean, what drives us is what drives everybody is is this sort of you know is a is a longing for justice and for for universal human dignity. Um, I think it's um, it's. Uh, uh, it's inescapable for for all but the the most corrupt Palestinians to not to not be a part of this collective struggle. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So um, sorry. So yeah. I mean, that's uh, uh, that's my answer. I mean, it's not it's it's not what drives us. Yeah. You know, I guess that the minority is is like what drives them not to. Um, and act and and resistance. Yeah, just, so, yeah. yeah, resistance isn't just you know taking up arms, which you know which I fully support actually yeah. uh, armed resistance, but it's you know it encompasses um, uh, literature, encompasses <laughs> writing, yeah. you yes. know living and getting on with your life and refusing to capitulate. It involves boycott. It involves um, uh, you know just. Uh, um, social media activism. I, you know, there, there's so many facets um, to to a people's struggle for for dignity. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, I'd also let's let's talk a little bit about Nahar. I loved how uh, you were able to portray her as a Palestinian, but also as a woman. Because when I read, especially with the first half of the book, I was really enjoyed uh, her coming of age in, so to say, where she finds empowerment uh, despite what the Western ideals for an empowered woman would be like. She celebrates her body. She's confident about it. She eventually gets into sex trade as well, but she isn't apologetic about all those things. Um, I also found this bit with her mother who works with the traditional Palestinian embroidery. And she says, I was all my life, I was waiting for a desk job, you know, and uh, she realizes and comes to that realization that her mother is uh, a woman of her own, despite yeah. whatever the Western ideal might be. And uh, this brings me to uh, Palestinian women in general. Um, 
you're portraying them in a light that we, we uh, in, in such a way that we are able to see through them, uh, but also relate to their struggles as women, as modern women. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit about that. Yeah, so, um, so as you said, I mean, Nahid, Nahid started out as um, a rather shallow young woman, just, you know, who, who had just kind of internalized what society told her she needs to want mm -hmm. and, and do. Um, and so this, the story isn't, it, it, it's about, you know, Nahid, well, it's not about, but one of the threads is Nahid sort of coming into her identity and finding, mm -hmm. um, just sort of delving into her identity as a Palestinian, but also um, there's a thread of of finding oneself as a woman beyond the beyond these sort of scripts that society gives us. So, for example, her mother, um, who who is this brilliant Tatris artist, right? She, yeah. she could embroider these beautiful caftan, caftans, but she didn't mm. see her own self worth. Um, she yeah. saw what the media what what society was valuing were these you know so-called modern women with a desk job yeah. like that's what she wanted a desk job, right um and so there's this there's also this sort of evolution of shedding these sort of western ideas about um who women are and what we right um and what how what kind of lives we need to live um nahad uh her evolution um, into the uh, the rebel that she became. Well, she was always a rebel, but into the revolutionary that she became. Um, began in with that you know very shallow uh, young woman who who had always had the seeds of defiance and rebellion. In yeah. her. But she not, you know, but she she like all her friends dreamed of you know finding the perfect man having lots of babies, um, maybe having, you know, modern appliances that would make all her friends jealous. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she very quickly, you know, finds herself as a, a jilted young wife um, and turns to sex work. So it isn't that she was unapologetic about it. She was actually, she was ashamed of it. She wasn't happy about that choice and it was, it was hoisted on her. But at the same time, she recognized, and this was much later in her life, she recognized the hypocrisy of, mm -hmm of, you know, because the men who visited her were supposedly these upstanding men in society. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it was through that, that recognition and that knowledge of sort of having a back door into what human beings are really like that, mm -hmm. that, that, that made her unapologetic. Um, because, I, you know, to her, it's like, who's she gonna apologize to? She's gonna apologize yeah. to these corrupt people <laughs> who, who, who have already trampled her and trampled her life and yeah. her body. And um, so I very much loved Nahed. I mean, it, she was, um, I, I fell in love with her and, and it was, it was a joy to, to discover her and write her and, and have her write her own story in many ways. And I think it was absolutely a joy for me to read her because I've, like I told you off uh, record as well, I've not read a woman who is so inspiring, so full of life, so exuberant and so defiant. Um, she kind of paves her own way and writes down her own, uh, you know, uh, makes her own path, writes her own destiny. And I think that is uh, what women mostly need to understand feminism is all about. It's about finding your own path. Uh, within the noise of the world. And thank you so much for giving us a character like Nahar. I've also got to talk to you about another fantastic female character and the friendship between these two, Umborak. Uh, this is a woman who claims to love her, but also kind of pushes her into sex trade. Um, how did you conceive this? And I think, again, I'm going to be showering praise on you uh, because I think Umborak is one of the most uh, gritty, one of the most truest characters I've read. Uh, she's not ambivalent and you don't fall in love with her right away. She is just the kind of person we meet, you know, she's in shades of gray and she does things which are objectionable, but you don't hate her for it. Yeah. How do you manage to do that as an author? And what drives you to make characters of, you know, write about the characters who are in those shades of gray? And aren't you like, uh, you know, don't you like sit back and consider, okay, what am I going to write and how are people going to perceive this? So I never ever think about how people are going to perceive things. Um, I like I always because I think that makes I think that hinders you as a writer. I think 
my 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 loyalty is always to the characters first and foremost there is what and that's been true with all of my books this with this book there was there were moments when i was um not so much thinking about the reader but i was i was uh considering this western gaze um on my work which wouldn't have been a consideration if i was writing in arabic um, but because i'm writing in english i did I did feel this Western gaze because I was writing about subjects that um, I was afraid were going to sort of confirm their stereotypes about us. Um, and I didn't want to fall into these Orientalist traps. I wanted to tell the truth and be, be honest and be loyal to these characters and tell their lives honestly um, without sort of, you know, pulling any punches or romanticizing them or just uh, uh, so I, I did consider that and that because I didn't want to fall into um, orientalizing our lives in some way. Um, uh, and I hope I haven't. Um, no, absolutely not. <laughs> um, thank you. But I, I, um, uh, yeah, so, so I don't, I, I don't create, I don't have um, outlines. I don't create sort of character development in my head at all my books just kind of like I write them and um, I have these first, you know, drafts that are, that are huge and unwieldy and they're really terrible writing with mostly stick figure <laughs> characters, but it's in, when I start rewriting and rewriting and, um, and then they start to come to life. Uh, and like I said, they tell their own stories. And I think when you do that, when you just have a loyalty to the character without really considering what anybody is going to think of you, think of your book, um, then then they come out as real, real people. Um, it, it's when I think if if you try to force them into an image or or you want the reader to feel a certain way about them, I think then it just it doesn't work. At least you know, at least for me. Um, Umburak was, um, so, you know, the relationships between women are complicated very often. And, and sometimes women who love each other very much uh, will, will also get tangled in, in jealousies and gossips and, and hurt and hurtful things against each other. Um, and this was the case, you know, Umburak was a survivor. Um, she was trying to, she was trying to live, right? Because she had her own compromised yeah. position in society yeah. and she, you know, she was doing what she had to do. And it, if it meant, you yeah. know, hurting other women, then that's what she had to do. But she was also, I mean, Mburak to me is one of these, you know, sort of older generation who were feminists without even knowing the word feminism. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, she had this basic sort of instinctive sense that this was a man's mm -hmm. world and she was going to get her her dues one way or another, you know, however. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that is so revolutionary and I'm sorry to cut you off over here, but Umburak does come as uh, this person who's always going to be there. She's going to have your back at the end of the day. But again, she's not somebody who's only looking for your best interest. So, I mean, she's got something in it for her as well. Uh, there's another relationship, uh, since you mentioned female friendships, uh, I feel that uh, one of my favorite authors when I, it comes to female friendship is Elena Ferrante. And I found that kind of thing uh, that you did over here as well with uh, Nahar and her best friend, you know, the kind of uh, relationship that they have when they're comparing their spouses and their lives. And she goes after Mohammed, who was actually uh, her friend's crush. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I love how uh, you're also able to put in light moments and give us the kind of feeling of living through these times. Like there's a portion in the book when, uh, you know, everybody is in lockdown and the Israelis, uh, you know, the colonizers have uh, put everybody inside their homes. And once that is lifted, there's a lot many babies being born around and there's weddings and there's celebrations. And uh, these people are saying, well, so be it, you know, let them know that we will live on. And I think that is such commendable spirit. Um, where do you get uh, the inspiration? Or I would say, uh, where do you get the kind of uh, 
a matter to put in, uh, you know, how do you decide on when to put in a life moment or do you think it comes intrinsically to you or does it have to be there um, in its own? Yeah, I mean, um, and again, so I like, I don't, I don't plan anything and I don't say, well, uh, there has to be a light moment here. There has to, that, I don't know mm -hmm. how to do that. I think, you know, better trained authors may, maybe can do that. But um, yeah. I mean, for me, I, um, I have a one track mind when I'm writing and it is to, to be in this moment and be honest and true to the characters. Um, and, and being in that moment, right, right, that that's what I imagine would happen. So, you know, in many ways, I feel like when I get to a certain point in the writing process, the characters really do um, tell their own story, they write their own lives in some ways. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that's the best way I can describe it. So it just, it really does just unfold in the rewriting and rewriting. Um, and it's its not hard to imagine, right? Because you have, yeah. you lock up all these people in their homes and what are they going to yeah. do? They, like they have nothing and they're just going to, you know, they're just going to make love. And, uh, and then, and then, and it's, and it's ironic, right? Because Israelis are so afraid of us as demographic threats. Yeah. Right, and so then they they lock us up in the house in our houses, and then suddenly there's this explosion. Boom. <laughs> right, yeah. There's another generation to follow. Yeah. Uh, right. One other thing I found really interesting is the way you link uh, the history of colonization uh, of the black people and the history of colonization of the Palestinian people. Like when there's a portion where Bilal and Nahar are sitting and they're reading uh, Baldwin to each other. And if you may allow me, I would like to read something that I have noted down. And I really liked it. It says, uh, I don't see how else anyone can survive colonialism. Understanding our own condition. I think in saying loved each other, Baldwin doesn't just mean the living. To survive by loving each other means to love our ancestors too. To know their pain, struggles and joys. It means to love our collective memory who we are, where we come from, he said. And after a silence for both of us to soak up that thought, he continued reading. Uh, there's also a bit over here right before this where he talks about loving the white people as well. You know, you, you've quoted Baldwin over there and you've said that, you know, even the white man deserves love. Do you feel that the, uh, the, the Israeli man also deserves love? So, um, so, Baldwin wasn't saying um, that they they deserve that you should love the white man because they deserve yeah. love. That's I, I don't believe that's not what he was saying. He was this was um, an essay written as um, a letter to his nephew, Little James. Um, yes. Uh, and where he says, uh, if, if you allow me to elaborate for the people who are listening to us, where he says that uh, because, uh, you know, the way that we have racism projected towards us, they have internalized racism without knowing that they have it within them. So we're talking in that context. Right. And and so um, what he is saying to his nephew is um, is to for is for his own heart is just, is to fortify his own life with love. Right. And, and he's, and he, it's not that um, he wasn't, it wasn't a kumbaya moment. That's not who James Baldwin was. James Baldwin was very much a defiant and he was a revolutionary. Um, mm -hmm. And, and he, uh, he wrote and worked and um, he did, he did all that for his, for, for the empowerment of of Black America, um, and it it was it was a lifelong um, quest for justice. Um, he was a brilliant literary figure as well, um, but it wasn't it wasn't this kind of you know we need to forgive them and love them kind of thing. That's not what he was saying at all, and that's not what Nahir and uh, and Bilal were saying. I don't need to love Israelis. Um, I don't love them. I don't love people who have destroyed my family, and I don't. I don't think I need to. 
and I don't, and that's not what James Baldwin was saying either. Um, but the question is to, you know, to, for ourselves, for our own children to not be consumed with, um, you know, uh, uh, bitterness or, or whatnot, mm -hmm. but to fortify our own lives and our own hearts for our own sake with love. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. I believe that that was a very interesting way of, uh, you know, equating the struggle of the black man to the struggle of the Palestinian. And I felt that you had done that wonderfully in your book, um, which so brings it's me. Not equating. I just want to, I just want to um, clarify. There, there, it's not equating. There's not, there's no sameness, but there are a yeah. lot of parallels. And I think, you know, yeah. going back to um, your earlier remark about feminism and what is feminism, it's not just, it's not just about women, but I think, you know, um, there's a big difference in between, I think, you know, white feminism and, uh, and, and the feminism of women who come from cultures and, and uh, societies of struggle. Yeah. And it is that there is, there has to be, or at least my brand of feminism encompasses, um, it encompasses uh, uh, anti-racist ideals. It encompasses um, anti-capitalist ideals, anti-colonial ideals. Um, it, so feminism has to be expansive and it has to be, it has to include what we now call intersectionality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, also, when, when we read the book, it uh, graduates between portions that have been written in the cube, which is where Nahar is confined and also portions that she writes or remembers while she is in the cube. And at the end, there is an acknowledgement where you've mentioned uh, a little bit about political prisoners and how you know political prisoners are people who you feel for. But tell us a little bit about your motivation to write about them and their struggles. So, you know, in, in, uh, in white American society, prison is a place um, on the margins. It's like, it's a place for where bad people go. But when you come from a society of struggle, um, like Black America, for example, or Palestinians, um, you know that your freest people, your, your, your bravest um, hearts are locked up in prison because, um, because prison and the legal system is weaponized uh, to, uh, to maintain oppression, to maintain, um, uh, uh, to silence people who are free, who are vocal, who are brilliant and who are leaders. And that's, um, you know, you see some of our, so when you are, when you come from a, a society of struggle, prison is actually central in your society, right? Palestinians, um, you know, when you go to prison, you go to an Israeli jail, you're not a bad person, you're a hero, because it means yeah. that you are defying, you are defying um, uh, our colonizers, and you are standing up to the people who are destroying us. So, so prison becomes a central place uh, where we find, where we find our heroes, where we find our brave people, our, um, our free people. And um, but at the same time, so this, this was a really tricky part for me. I also felt, it, you know, I think when, when you write about experiences like that, there's an ethical responsibility as a writer um, to, to get it right. And I didn't, um, that, and that's the reason why I created this entirely fictional uh, prison. Um, I yeah. didn't feel like I had a right to try and um, depict an actual prison, you know, um, where people have actually have lived and suffered. So, so I made an entirely fictional environment for her. But I, I did a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of watching of interviews. Um, I spoke with uh, members of the Move family in Philadelphia who had been released um, after 40 years of being in prison. They, they were political prisoners as well. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was through that that I, through, you know, through that kind of research that I uh, began to imagine Nahar in, in this environment. Perfect. 
I'd also, um, I'm going to wind up this discussion and then come to your work as an activist as well. <clears throat> I'd just like to uh, read out one of my favorite quotes from the book, where Nahar tells a woman, uh, we are not all blessed to receive a good education and inherit what it takes to live with some dignity. To exist on your own land in the bosom of your family and your history, to know where you belong in the world and what you're fighting for, to have some goddamn value. I thought those were very powerful words, Susan. Uh, and I would like you to talk a little bit about that particular saying, that quote, and also how the politics of your region, the politics of the Middle East or Palestine, has affected you as a writer and has affected your writing. Um, so that quote, is very much in line with Nahar, um, Nahar's kind of defiance, right? She's not, she's not, you know, when she went to Palestine, I, she was a little apprehensive about what, what might have preceded her in terms of, you know, gossip and about her reputation and whatnot. Um, but at the same time, she was, she was not going to apologize to anybody about yeah. her life even if deep inside she was broken and wounded mm -hmm. and, and ashamed. Um, she was never going to let anybody see that. And, and so that was a moment um, when she's confronted with, you know, with her reputation and, and she's completely indignant. And, um, uh, and again, it's, she sort of echoes this hypocrisy, like, oh, that's so nice that you who have been born into so much privilege, yeah. you get to judge me. Um, and, you know, all these women that you're talking about with such feminist fervor in Syria and, and whatnot, and she sort of gives her the reality, like, these people mm -hmm. are having to sell their, their daughters and their sons so they can eat. So, yeah. you know, this world isn't, um, uh, it's different, you know, for people who, who find themselves at the bottom of the barrel of humanity than it is for those who have some privilege to, to reject these things. Um, and, and that was very much part of not his evolution to her emotional and spiritual evolution, um, and intellectual evolution. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, so, um, what, sorry, what was the, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's what that's a wonderful response firstly uh the other part of my question was how has the politics of the region uh, affected okay. you personally and as a writer so i mean you know we as palestinians uh as coming from a society that whose whose very existence is is denied and and uh, and who are quite literally being wiped off the planet and and erased from history um it becomes i mean it becomes such a a, a a profound part of one's identity to 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 always struggle against our our erasure. It's there's there's something existential in it. So it um, it's hard to to kind of pinpoint exactly how it has influenced me or or whatnot. It has, um, but it certainly appears in my writing. It appears in my activism. It has given me a sense of urgency, um, a a uh, an un a defiance, um, a feeling that, um, and a, a rather an assuredness that I'm on solid moral and historic ground, and um, my my voice is um, can never waver from from. Uh, from this truth that is that is in my mind unshakable, I belong um, to that land because my ancestors are all buried there. Because we go back hundreds, if not thousands, of years, verifiably, um, and and because in many ways Palestine, the issue of Palestine and the liberation of Palestine, is a test for the whole world. If Palestine is allowed to, if the world allows Israel to continue to erase Palestine, to destroy us, um, then then there really is no moral authority uh, for for anyone. Um, you know the the whole idea, the whole idea that there can be justice, it just it it will collapse. Um, 
Palestine is the only issue that is still um, the only instance of obvious settler colonialism that is still debated as if Palestinians are the aggressors. It's, mm -hmm. it's astounding. And that's why I say it's a test. It's a test to um, it's a test to international for international law. It's a test for um, what humanity will accept. It's a test. Um, it's a test for for the direction that humanity is going to take. Are we going to move towards liberation? Because when Palestine is liberated, when we move in that direction, there there's hope for all of us. Because this is the one issue that this imperial superpower is, is dead set on making happen and, and move toward um, capitalist imperialism and fascism. Um, and if, we, and if, if the world allows this to continue, then that's the direction that humanity will continue in, in other parts of the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, other, there, there are, there are instances of great oppression in many parts of the world, Kashmir being one of them. Yeah. But, but everywhere in the world, the, these issues are recognized for what they are. You will see real and robust condemnation um, in international bodies. You will see, um, you know, there's no mincing of words uh, of, of these other instances of, of oppression. But when it comes to Israel, there is this extraordinary exalting of, of these foreign colonizers and the blaming of, of the indigenous population that had been there, that had always been there. So that's why I say it's a test. Thank you, Susan. Um, for all those young Palestinians, for all those young Pakistanis, for all those young Kashmiris who are watching you or will be watching you in the future, once you know what you have to fight for, what do you suggest is the way one takes uh, their fight forward? Do you feel social media activism or activism through the pen is something that can bring about a valuable change? And if so, how do you suggest uh, we take it up in our own way? Yeah, so I think so that, that's, a very, um, that's a very personal decision. And everybody knows their own capabilities, their own limitations, their own talents. Um, in general, however, I think struggle has to always be multifaceted and it must exist on a plane of internationalism. There must be, um, uh, there must, there must be a sense of solidarity and organizing um, among like-minded struggles. Um, I think as individuals, we are limited when we're, um, you know, pitted against power, you know, yeah. which is the reason why organizing as in groups is so important. Uh, our power is in our numbers. And, and, and you have to look at it from the point of view of the powerful. They yeah. are terrified of people, of organized people. They are terrified of a population that pours into the streets and has very clear and cohesive demands. Nothing terrifies them more. And to me, whatever tactics, whatever gets us to that point is, is worthwhile. Whether it's social media activism, whether it's you know in-person organizing, whether it's writing, whether it's taking up arms, sabotage, whatever. Um, you know, I think, I think all of these means are legitimate means when you are fighting for your survival and you're fighting for, mm -hmm. um, I also, I want to also say that I think it's, um, and we, we often kind of ignore the space in which we exist in. Um, I think w when we when we organize, we have to also consider our um, our planet and wildlife and um, what it means to inhabit this earth as living beings uh, and, and understand that this planet isn't ours alone. 
Um, and that's also part of the intersectionality and the internationalism that I'm talking about. It's not just communion with, you know, with other like-minded societies, yeah. each part of it, but it's also communion with the space in which we exist. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in the past, it was easy for the world to ignore that because there was a sense that the earth was, was boundless and limitless and it would just, you know, it would regenerate no matter what. But we know that's mm. not true. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, and, and every time I speak, I always want to, 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 to make a plug for, for animals for wildlife, for, for, for the rights of other living beings to inhabit this planet um, without being molested by us for whether it's for food or for experimentation mm -hmm. or for pleasure or entertainment or whatever, all the other horrible things we do. Thank you, Susan. Coming back to uh, what you said about uh, Palestine and about how uh, things have history, places have history and value, brings me back to a point in the book where Nahar's mother goes back to her home of very many years from which she had been driven out. And uh, there's this incident where the Israeli woman who lives over there now calls the police on her, calls the cops on her. And I, that really broke my heart and it made me feel for the, the, the millions and millions of people who have felt that, who felt that displacement, that sense of detachment, uh, forced detachment from uh, their places of birth or their places of being. I also want to take this opportunity to talk to you about uh, Playgrounds for Palestine, which is, a, uh, which is a venture that you have founded. What is it all about and what do we do uh, in, uh, for Playgrounds for Palestine? Um, so Playgrounds for Palestine is um, a, a children's organization. We, I mean, it's very simple. We're based in the US. We, uh, there's also a UK chapter. Um, okay. we go playgrounds for Palestinian children who live under Israeli occupation or who live in refugee camps um, in, in neighboring countries. Um, you know, it's, the mission is simple, but it's, it's a lot of work, you know, getting, you know, getting yeah. there. Um, we're an all volunteer group. No, none of us get paid or anything like that. It's entirely a labor of love. We spend the year um, uh, uh, raising money through various means and, uh, and we use that money to implement um, projects like summer camps, we build playgrounds, we, we fund kindergartens, things like that. Um, the other thing that I'm working on now is, um, is a Palestinian literature festival. It's called Palestine Rights. It's gonna take place yeah. online, um, December the 2nd through the 6th. So, I, um, and it's open, it's, uh, it's free to anybody who wants to, uh, to wants, who wants to join. It's going to be um, an incredibly um, uh, jam-packed and, and wonderful, uh, uh, literature festival so i hope you'll check it out it's it's uh, palestinerights.org i think we would love to check this out and i think one of the uh, silver linings to this entire pandemic has been the fact that we've been able to attend so very many events yeah. and you know be, yeah. been to so many places that we wouldn't have been to um under normal circumstances i would have never imagined sitting right in front of you and having a conversation with you but this is truly a dream come true. I am honored. Thank you so much for giving us the time. I'd also like to end this chat by telling everybody about Susan's book, the, the book that we've been talking about. This is Against the Loveless World by Susan Abulhawa, a book that I have read in recent times that has moved me. Um, I'm generally a very slow reader, but this one took me only like, I think, 48 hours. I, I really zoomed through it. It was a joyride. It was meaningful and it it really broke my heart towards the end because it made me think about so many people who live like this or live similar life and are driven to the margins so thank you so much susan for writing and for being the wonderful person that you are and for making the time for us today as well and I, it was an honor and a pleasure and i um and I, I told you this offline but i'll tell you you know on the air too i really I appreciate so much that um, that you read the book and that you that you wanted to talk about the characters and uh, because very often you know as Palestinian writers like we are approached as you know these political beings and it's all about politics as if we don't have you know creativity and I see I, I can tell you're maybe some kids you have around you it's like, I understand my, my dogs are I have some in the background <laughs> Great. That's what we do as women, right? <laughs>
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, Susan, again, if anybody is not following Susan, she is very active on Instagram. She's a very active activist, active activist uh, for everything that she believes in. And she's somebody who I personally look up to very much. Uh, thank you, Susan, for making the time. I'm honored and I hope you will be coming up with more stories, more books uh, for us to read and devour in the very same way. Thank you, Dar. Thank you so much, Sana. It was a pleasure. And Reza and everyone who attended. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you to the University of Central Punjab for organizing this for us. Thank you, Raza. Um, I believe he is around um, for organizing this. We had a great time. And if you have any questions, do put them down.